Hello, everyone. We are beginning today our second of the series of Spiritual Warfare. Last week, we uh, looked into a little bit of a background of how it all started when Lucifer, one of the archangels at the time, known today as Satan, he gathered a group of rebellious angels, whom we call demons today, to dare to overthrow the throne of Almighty God. Can you believe it? It's still mind-boggling to even contemplate that someone who was in the presence of Almighty God wanted and desired to do that. It was a one-time only rebellion. Angels no longer fall, and that will never happen again. Now, there's so much uh, talk about angels among Christians and non-Christians alike. Uh, there's there are books about them, movies about them, uh, p greeting cards, bookmarkers, trinkets, jewelry, all sorts of, of talk about angels. Uh, most often uh, incorrect, especially when, when Hollywood gets a hold of what they want to do with, with angels. Um, but they, they are real. They are spirit beings. They do at times manifest themselves to us, even in human form. It tells us in Hebrews 13, doesn't it, to be careful when you entertain strangers. You just might be entertaining an angel. Uh, so we know they can take on a bodily form. Um, also, let me, while we're in Hebrews, mentioning Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, listen to this. It says, angels are servants, spirits, this is 114. Angels are servants, spirits, sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. They are uh, used by God to care for us, to minister to us. Isn't that amazing? Does God need angels to do his work, to help him out? No, but he created them just as he created us. We have a special place because you and I are adopted sons and daughters uh, when we receive the gift of salvation from his son and sealed by the Holy Spirit within us. So we have that special intimate relationship with God the Father that angels do not have. Nonetheless, God created them and he chose to use them at times to help us. Does he need them? No. Does he need us? No. But in his love, he created them and he created us. So let's look a bit into angels today. First of all, just out of um, um, interest, a little aside here, they are mentioned 108 times in the Old Testament, 165 times in the New Testament. They appear to be a hierarchy of angels. There are archangels, and there are only three um, that are mentioned. One was Lucifer, and he is no longer. He is Satan. He fell. Then there is Michael, and there is Gabriel as archangels. Then there are cherubs, seraphim, and host, host of angels. Host, uh, sometimes you'll read uh, in, in the Bible, the Lord of hosts. It's the Lord of all the mighty angels, innumerable Thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands. We cannot count. There is no count of them, but they are as far as the eye can see, a host of angels. Seraphim are mentioned uh, in Ezekiel, again in Revelation, not as much as the cherubim. Seraphim are the only angels described as having wings. Uh, most often we see pictures of little chubby babies with small wings, don't we? When we, uh, we, we see pictures of, of what the world imagines angels to be like. But seraphim have three pairs of wings two wings of which they fly. Often it's described of flying above the throne of God. It seems they are there just to minister to from God himself as he bids them to do whatever he wants them to do, but they are very close to the throne of God. Uh, one pair of wings to fly, another pair covers their face, probably in respect and humility, and the other their feet, which indeed is always uh, humility and a sign that they know they are in the presence of great holiness. Remember when uh, when uh, Moses was, uh, he heard the voice of God in, in the burning bush and the voice said to remove your sandals, you are walking on holy ground. To be in the presence of God is uh, ultimate holiness indeed. And the seraphim, they cover their feet in humility. And then we have the cherubim. Now cherubim, they are the ones, the cherubs, who are most often pictured um, as the chubby little babies with short little wings. Uh, but the first time we read about cherubim is in Genesis chapter 4. It's right after... Uh, Adam and Eve had sinned and they were dismissed from the garden. And it tells us that God placed a cherubim um, at the entrance to guard the way to the tree of life so that they would not come back and eat of it and then be eternal, eternally doomed in their sinful state. God was already setting his plan of salvation uh, uh, in, into force. So he wanted to, to guard them from eating that tree of life at that time. We will eat freely of it uh, when the new heavens and new earth are created. So, he also had a flaming sword. So cherubim are mighty and strong. In fact, 
we often read in the Bible of their strength. It tells us in Revelation, I believe chapter 18, that there's going to come a time you know, in the end times, the tribulation time on earth is going to be terrible, many weather catastrophes. And it says that one angel picked up a great boulder and tossed it into the sea. And perhaps that caused some tsunami effect. I don't know. Um, but they have tremendous, tremendous strength. It was an angel who rolled back the stone when Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb. And that was a heavy stone indeed, but they rolled it back and was perched on top of it. So angels, they are, they are strong. Um, do we know what they look like? Probably one of the best descriptions we have, let's have a look at it, is in, let's see, in Daniel. I thought I had that marked for ready look. Here we go. Daniel chapter 10. Listen to this. We'll look at, uh, we'll begin to look at verse 4, Daniel 10, 4. It says, as I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and I saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious gem. His face flashed like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and his feet shone like polished bronze, and his voice roared like a vast multitude of people. Now that doesn't sound like a fat little baby with short wings, does it? This is a this is a mighty angel. It says, Only I, Daniel, saw this vision. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified. Oh, I guess so. Maybe they heard it, something. I don't know. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. And then Daniel says, My strength left me. My face grew deathly pale, and I felt very weak. Um, I, I thought about that for a long time, and I, I realized then, you know, angels are in, the, they're already in, I don't know, heavenly bodies, and they have this super strength, and they must be magnificent looking just from that one description. And Daniel, like you and I, we are still in our earthly bodies that grow weak. And uh, just I think just to be in such an amazing presence he, well, it says later on, he says he just fainted. And then the angel touched him and lifted him up. I think in the presence of, of just such splendor, he couldn't take it in his regular body. One day when we have our new resurrected bodies, oh, we'll be able to, to look at the angels and, oh, just to, oh, I can't, oh, I cannot hardly even imagine it. Uh, but we have that to look forward to in our future. So there we have just a little bit about what angels look like. So we have the cherubim, uh, the seraphim, the host, a host of, of an army of angels. Um, then someone asked, uh, do we each have guardian angels? Let me read something to you in Matthew chapter 18. This is where Jesus is encouraging not to refuse the little children to come to him. And he says in verse 10, beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. No, for I tell you that in heaven, their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly father, their angels. It rather indicates that each of these children had a particular angel guardian over them, um, which would seem that we might all have them, but whether we do or not specifically, it doesn't, I've not found it. It comes right out and says specifically, everyone has a guardian angel, but I, I wouldn't worry about that uh, if I were you, because as we've reminded ourselves in Hebrews chapter one, that angels are spirits sent to minister at God's bidding uh, to us, to those who have become Christians, to those who are the children of God. So whether we have a personal guardian angel or not, <clears throat> excuse me, there are a host of angels that God uses on numerous occasions to come and minister to us and to help us. My father and I were talking one time and um, I, my, my, one of my many airplane flights had been delayed and it was just a little irritating. And I can remember my dad just so calm and he was looking and he was saying, you know, I have a feeling when we all get to heaven, we're going to discover that many of God's, many of life's delays was simply God protecting, perhaps even sending his angels to to, uh, to take care of matters for us. On Perhaps we were kept safe by a delay. Um, just all sorts of things. It made me think. And so since then, I, I really have been more calm about cancellations and, and just life's delays, because it could be true. Um, sometimes, um, I, well, I met someone one time, their car broke down and they were, oh, they were late for some appointment. So I said the same thing to them that my dad did. I said, my dad told me this one time and they thought about it and they said, you know, who knows? Maybe my car broke down because it wasn't my time yet. And I might've been in an accident down the road. I said, who knows? Maybe. 
I, I think my father's right. When we get to heaven, we're all going to understand many, many times when we were saved from something, from some pain, from early death itself. Because as my father also used to say, no one leaves this earth until the father says, come home. And, uh, and so he, he, will guard, he will guard us until that time when it is our, our precious privilege to go on home and to be present with him. So a few little thoughts there about angels and uh, whether or not we have guardian angels. We certainly have a host of angels who will come to our rescue and help us on many occasions as God directs. Um, angels carry out God's commands always. Let me read something to you. This is Psalm 103 chapter 103 listen to this starting with verse 20 it says praise the lord you angels you mighty ones who carry out his plans mm -hmm. listening for each of his commands okay, just, they're just waiting listening whatever he says to do they're going to do it. it says yes praise the lord you armies of angels who serve him and who do his will wow this is a uh, uh, this is what angels are for. They are messengers uh, and they are sent to do his will. We know they are messengers. There are plenty of examples. One of the most famous, of course, is in Luke when the archangel Gabriel uh, came to Mary, who was going to be the earthly mother of Jesus, and told her that she was going to conceive the Christ child. Gabriel himself, one of God's uh, two remaining archangels, Gabriel and Michael, those are the only two that scripture reveals to us. Um, and came to Mary and, and gave her that good news. Wow, a, a message from God himself to speak to her. And then we know when Jesus was born, uh, as the shepherds were in the field, there was a host of angels singing and giving praise to God for this event. Oh, the angels just, must, oh, they must have just been amazed when they first learned of God's plan to provide salvation to mankind for their big mess up in sinning in the first place by sending his own precious Holy Son to take on the form of man. And they saw him being born of a woman, a human woman. Oh, wow, that must have just been mind blowing. And then when it came time for him to die on that cross, it says as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying so intently that blood vessels in his forehead. This is a scientific fact. This can happen. Someone can be under such stress that the tiny little blood vessels, uh, capillaries, I think they're called, can just burst and actually bleed out. And, uh, and Jesus was bleeding. It says in the scripture that angels were there to minister to him, to encourage. Uh, remember, he was 100% God, but 100% man. And in his 100% manness, he, uh, he was dreading what was coming. That's why he prayed in his man self, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. If there's another way, let that happen. But nonetheless, in his God self, nonetheless, your will be done, not mine, but your will be done. And the angels were sent from God the Father to minister and encourage his son. Angels often come to us. We don't always know it, as it says in Hebrews 13. Uh, be careful who you entertain. Be careful who you're talking to and helping. It could be an angel from God sent to encourage you. Uh, so we don't know. Uh, that'll be fun to find out when we get to heaven also, won't it? So they are, they, they come as messengers as we saw and, and as comforters, encouragers. We saw what they looked like. Considering what they looked like, oh, let me just read something else. I think this is also in Hebrews. Yes, Hebrews chapter one. Listen to this. Verse seven it says, regarding angels, God says, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. You know, I said last week, this is not an exhaustive study. This is what I call answers in a nutshell to whet your appetite. Uh, you, you might be interested. I'll give you a challenge, a personal challenge. Look through scripture at the times angels are described as coming like wind or like fire. Uh, wind and fire. And it says here again, his, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. Now, I'm just going to share something. This is my musings here. This is the gospel according to Vicki, so hold it very lightly. These are just some thoughts. When I was thinking about angels and winds and fire, my mind was taken <clears throat> to Acts um, chapter 2 in the first four verses. This is after Jesus has ascended. 
uh, from the Mount of Olives. And uh, the angel said to those who are watching, Jesus actually go up into the clouds. And the angel said, why are you standing here just looking? Uh, just remember that the, in the same way you saw him go, he is one day going to return. And we know that at the second coming, not the rapture, the second coming, Jesus is going to return and place his foot right on that same spot uh, on the Mount of Olives. Isn't that just amazing? And that could uh, be not too far off indeed, according to all the signs. Um, but he says uh, he is going to, to come back. And then listen to this, Acts 2, 4. He's telling them this, and then they go they all gathered in an upper room together. They're waiting. What are they waiting for? The promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been promised to reside in the heart and of mankind. Again, another mind-blowing thing. Everyone listening who knows Jesus Christ and myself who know Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of Almighty God is residing in you. That had never happened before until after Jesus ascended and, and the disciples and others who were waiting went back to wait for that promise. They were instructed, wait there until the promise of the Holy Spirit comes. And we know what it says in Acts 2 verses 1 through 4. It says, suddenly there was a rushing wind and then what appeared as like tongues of fire above the heads of each one. Ah, and, and the Holy Spirit came and they were indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Now, I've often, over the years of knowing Jesus, I've often thought that must have just been so magnificent. And I've thought about that wind whoosh, blowing through, rushing. What was that like? And, and the tongues of fire appearing over their heads. Now, this is just a thought. Again, gospel according to Vicki, just a speculation. But considering what we've just read in Hebrews, that they come like winds and like fire, flames of fire, do you think just as the angels were invited to, uh, to witness the birth of Jesus in human form, and they were in a host of heavenly angels praising God. Do you think God invited them to witness this next magnificent event when the Holy Spirit of God was going to come and indwell man individually? Wow, do you think so? Was that the angels who were whoosh, blowing in to watch the event? Were that angels hovering, appearing like flames of fire above their heads? Was that angels of God filling that room to watch this event? The Bible does not tell us. I don't know. It's just a thought, interesting thought. And I just uh, decided to share that with you. Do, you. do you see how fun it is when we put on our spiritual diving suits and we deep sea dive into God's word? Because you never know what treasures are still there for us to discover or even things just to ponder upon to muse about and i'm musing about this rushing wind and this and the flames of fire that appeared uh on what we call the day of pentecost in that upper room i'm just musing about it but it, it's fun to go spiritually deep sea diving i encourage you indeed um to do that now a few more things about angels they have limitations they are not omnipresent they are not everywhere at once they uh they only go where god tells them to go they cannot hear our thoughts we do not pray to angels. Uh, I've had people say to me, oh, I called upon the angels to come and help. And uh, I always try to gently remind uh, as best I can, uh, we've already got the best help. It's God himself. And God, as we've just talked about, his Holy Spirit is within us. And it tells us in John 4, that John 14, that he is sent to be our teacher, our guide, our comforter. We have God himself within us by his spirit. We already have all the encouragement we need. We already have available to us everything in the Holy Spirit that we need to be our teacher, our comforter, our guide. Remember, though, that God himself will choose at which times to perhaps send angels to minister and assist us. We may sometimes know there's an angel present. Most often, we will not. Most of us will go through our physical life never having seen an angel, never having been aware that one was present helping us but they are there. But we do not pray to angels. We pray to God alone. Jesus is the one who intercedes for us between us and his Father, not angels. So just keep that in mind. Also, someone asked me once, um, when my loved ones die, do they come back as angels? No, no. Did I say that? Is, is this at the beginning? Forgive me if I'm 
repeating myself because it's very important to know that no angels have their place created beings we have our place sons and daughters of the most high king wow there are many places in the old and new testament again i encourage you to do your own um, digging in your own spiritual deep sea diving um, we have examples of when angels were sent to physically feed um, um, Hagar uh, in, in Genesis, uh, she was hungry. Her and her son Ishmael, they were cast away by Sarah, uh, Abraham's wife, over some jealousy there. And, uh, and an angel came and ministered and showed her where there was water to drink and where there was food and took care. And we, many, many examples. Go, go through, do some digging uh, in, 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 the, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as one example I've already mentioned to Jesus himself uh, when he was uh, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane and the angels were there to minister to him. And we see this in many places. Uh, it just comes to mind, Peter. In Acts, I think it's Acts chapter 10 or 12, um, I think it's 10, uh, Peter was in jail and, uh, and an angel was sent and opened the door, woke up, woke up Peter, I think it punched him, it says, <clears throat> knocked him in the arm or something or kicked his foot and said, Peter, get up and led him out. <clears throat> Excuse me, that frog's getting me this morning. So many examples of how they are, are sent, again, at God's command to assist us. Um, there are some modern day, what I call more modern day, uh, examples as m many of you maybe have your own examples uh, I, I encourage you if, you if you want some to hear some exciting things read about the six-day war which took place in 1967 this was happened in Israel and the, the countries of Egypt Jordan Syria and Iraq um, they declared uh, they were coming against Israel Sadly, at that time, the USA decided not to intervene, and they considered it a local matter. And as far as the Arab world, um, on hearing that news, they were concerned there was going to be massacre, and they were going to take over Israel. And so the Six-Day War began, and Israel was outnumbered um, by all the soldiers, outnumbered completely. But here are just two examples that I read. This is documented. You can search it for yourself. Uh, it's, it's documented within the writings of the 1967 Six-Day War. There was a story of a soldier, an Israeli soldier, and he was at the edge of the Sinai Desert. He was by himself waiting for his own troops to return. Why they left him by himself, I don't know, but there he was. And he sees an Arab truck coming, 18 soldiers with their assault rifles, and he thought, well, this is it. And so he stood there waiting to be shot, I suppose, or taken prisoner. But his account is, and the Arab soldiers later, they, they told this story, uh, suddenly they got near, they raised their own rifles, whether to shoot or whether just to take him prisoner, I don't know. But suddenly all the rifles flew in the air and onto the ground. <laughs> and so the one soldier uh, instructed one to come and kick the rifles over and he took them all prisoner. The Arab soldiers said later that some force came upon them and grabbed their assault rifles out of their arms and threw them onto the ground. And they were just like frozen, they couldn't move. Uh, do you think that might have been an unseen angel of God? Just boom, we know they're strong. Just take them like matchsticks probably and toss them to one side. I think so. Uh, I, I can think of no other explanation than that. Um, there is a, a, another story when uh, two Israeli soldiers were, were there. And um, uh, I don't know how many soldiers, but the enemy was coming and the two were greatly outnumbered. And they were standing there and they, they told the story later that they thought, well, this is it. They're either going to kill us or take us prisoner. This is it. And they came near and suddenly they came and they just dropped their guns and they all held up their hands. Uh, uh, they were greatly outnumbered. So the two Israeli soldiers were like, wow, okay, you know, march forward and, and captured them all and took them back to their own camp as prisoners. Later, when the Arab soldiers were asked, why did you surrender to two? You were greatly outnumbered. Why? They said, what do you mean two? There must have been more than 50 who stood up. We were greatly outnumbered. The two Israeli soldiers didn't see anybody, but the enemy did. Do you think it was the angels of God? Mm, I kind of got a feeling, yes, I think so. And so they are, again, they are sent at God's command to protect, to minister to us, uh, to, to keep us from danger. Sometimes we know and sometimes we don't know, uh, but they are there and doing God's bidding on our, on our behalf to help us, to assist us. Now, <clears throat> Just in, in closing today, how does understanding angels help us in our own study of spiritual warfare? If we know we can't pray to them, if we know that keeping a trinket in our pocket is, is not a good luck charm, we, we have the Holy Spirit within us, that's all we need. Um, what, what, what can we learn knowing that angels are out there? What, how does this help us? Well, 
one, it's an encouragement to us, isn't it? To know that, um, as it says in Hebrews, in Hebrews 1, that they are spirits sent from God to minister to us, to watch over us and take care of us at God's command. God, of course, is omnipresent. He's always there, but he will choose. We don't know why God chooses everything he does, but he will choose at times to send an angel to intervene on our behalf. Uh, in spiritual warfare, that's comforting to know, don't you feel? That's comforting. That's encouraging. And also, and this is the most important, listen to this. Do you remember in scripture uh, when, when Jesus was born? And it says in, in Luke that uh, there was a host of heavenly angels just praising God uh, for what he had done, sending Jesus, the Son of God, in baby form to grow up like a man. And it says that Jesus was tempted in all areas, uh, like same as us, but yet he did not sin. And um, oh, and so it, it says the angels at that time when Jesus was born, they were worshiping. We can learn so much from angels about worship. When we read in Revelation, we see often many times that the angels were worshiping, bowing down at the feet before God Almighty, worshiping him. I personally believe that worship is our number one defense and offense against any attack of the enemy. It is the best thing we can do is to worship. When we are tempted to sin, when we are feeling weak, when our mind is contemplating, when the enemy, we're going to talk about this in weeks to come, is whispering his lies saying, it won't matter just this once. Oh, he'll forgive you later. And we start to consider it. Oh, at that moment, let me encourage you something. At that moment, choose to worship immediately. And by the way, go ahead and tell him, get thee behind me and say it out loud. Um, angels, de demons cannot hear our thoughts. Say it out loud. Get behind me, Satan, and then worship God. Say, oh God, my Father, you know right now I am being tempted and I do not want to sin against you. I worship you and I praise you that you are my everything to get me through anything at all. And we worship. Oh, and, and music. Oh, music just lifts my heart. Uh, I, I admire that gift in people, those who can sing and play instruments and worship. And I, I just love to join in, making my own joyful noise before the Lord. But I love to join in and lift my voice in worship. Haven't you had those experiences when you're worshiping, whether it's in prayer, verbal praise, through music, through singing, through dancing to the Lord, hands wrist lifted high. Wow. Uh, don't you just feel that closeness with him? Sometimes it can be so sweet. You almost feel you could just reach out and touch heaven itself, don't you? Oh, it can be so sweet. Worship is strengthening to us in everyday battle. I encourage you, worship every day. Take time every day to worship. You know, when we pray, we want to, of course, bring all of our needs to the Father. We want to, of course, come to the Father and say, I need your help in this matter, but let me encourage you. Never forget to worship, even when you are giving your request to him. Never forget to say, Lord, I need this today. I need your guidance today. I'm feeling sorrowful today. I need you to comfort me today. And then, Father, I praise you that you are able to be what I need. I praise you, Father, that everything I need to know is in your holy word, that it is truth. I thank you, Father, that there is no other way to you but through your son, Jesus, and he has forgiven me everything, everything. I praise you, Father. Oh, I can just, oh, even just reminding myself of that now as I'm talking to you, I just, oh, don't you just, woof, ah, kind of get tingly all over in excitement. Worship the Father. The enemy hates it. And what do we say to that? Good, <laughs> good. Let him hate it. Let us worship the best thing, the best offense, the best defense against any attack of the enemy. Oh, I hope that blesses you. I've just been blessed myself, reminding myself of it. Wow. Oh, so remember, angels, one of the blessings of God that he sends to assist us. But worship is never to the angel. Worship is to God himself. Thankfulness to God himself for his angels, for the times he sends his angels uh, to guide, to encourage, to minister to us. We will continue our study next week. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, until then, you be most blessed indeed. See you next time.